Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be interviewing exorcist Father Carlos Martins. That's right. Father Carlos Martins has a really exciting new podcast called The Exorcist Files. I'm going to talk about this new project and all of his work as a priest and as an exorcist. An exorcist is about to tell his story, and you're not going to want to miss it. Thank you, Father, for joining us today. Really intrigued about uh, your podcast. I think for all of our listeners out there, they can uh, view your podcast at exorcistfiles.tv, or just like our podcast, you can download you know, all of our different streams and the availabilities that we have on different platforms. So welcome, Father. I, we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, and before we had Father on, I didn't know that you two actually know each other. Yeah, we we met initially in Meinrad. We're both missionaries of mercy of the Holy Father and uh, exercise our mission and our zeal around the world. And, and it's awesome to connect through this platform. You know, moving new evangelization online is just so important to establish the church and the digital continent. And what a joy to be able to link up today, Father Carlos, and to hear more specifically about Exorcist Files. And we definitely want to encourage everybody out there definitely check out the website. It is sharp. I'm on yeah. it right now, exorcistfiles.tv. And, you know, you're on all the, the podcasting forums that we are, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and I'm sure Podbean as I'm well. I'm sure, absolutely. <laughs> they scoop up everything. <laughs> so, but Father, uh, congratulations, number one, on the success of this. But I think the success of it speaks to the interest and the, and the deep fascination people have with exorcism in particular and how it speaks to the reality of, of the influence of evil in the world and how people can intrinsically feel that, but it seems often removed from so many people. So when they get the opportunity to hear from a real exorcist, it's something that immediately grabs their interest. So did you expect the kind of success you're having with the exorcist files, or is this a surprise to you? Um, it's it's a surprise. Uh, I experienced, uh, well, I mean, uh, kind of a, a, a feeling or kind of an awareness that there, there would be interest in it. I mean, I knew there would be. Um, the evil is primordial, and it strokes something in the human person. But to discuss evil in kind of a serious way, to discuss evil as evil, is not everyone's cup of tea. Um, I was just surprised. I, I was astounded at, as to how popular the podcast uh, went. Uh, I mean, as of as of this morning, it is um, well, and for that for over the past week, it's been the number one downloaded uh, religion and spirituality podcast on Spotify, which is uh, the largest platform in the world. So I I just I never thought there would be this kind of popularity with it. Mm -hmm. So. You are an exorcist. What does that mean? Because for a lot of our viewers, they don't understand really the 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 office of the exorcist. They think that the Vatican's training him in the basement of the Vatican, like like ninjas in a James Bond movie. <laughs> and the reality of what an exorcist is is very different than that. And where your authority comes from, and where your training comes from. Right, right. So um, when I, I so I I have taught exorcists. Uh, I'm invited a lot to speak at conferences where exorcists are trained. Um, so to, I'm going to give a line that I, for, for which I'm, I'm, I'm well known and, and which I repeat often, the, the job of the exorcist is not to cast out the devil. The job of the exorcist is to find out why is the devil there? What rights has he gained? And it's then his task to work with the victim at rescinding those rights. If their rights are rescinded, then the devil has to leave. If they are not rescinded, he will not leave. And so right away, that, that puts exorcism in a place different than what most people think. Most people think an exorcist comes in and he's armed with a ritual, uh, he's armed with holy water, a crucifix, and all the other paraphernalia he's got, and he's going head to head with the demon. And because he's a priest and because he's operating in the authority of the church and because he has all of these other sacramentals, tools and instruments that he's using, 
uh, he's able to beat the demon into submission and, and nothing could be further from the truth. You, you never take on a demon head to head. Uh, a demon is a fallen angel and angels were created with immense power. So the task, his task is to find out precisely why is he there? How did he come in? There was a door opened, in other words. Through which door did he walk in? And that door now has to be closed. Uh, so so in, in, in order for him to be expelled, his attachment to the victim and the way by which he's attached to the victim, that has to be eliminated. And once that's eliminated, now we have a, a cleansing that can then occur. But until that is done, he has every right to be there. And just like in your own home, you have a right to be in your home. Uh, a neighbor has no right uh, to, to expect the police uh, to come in and evict you out of your own home for no reason, uh, because you have a right to be there. And, and your, your neighbor does not have the right uh, to, to declare that you ought not to be there. And the same as an exorcism. All I can do, all any exorcist can do, is point the victim to Christ and ask for the victim's cooperation in expelling the demon. And, and I will say this, you know, in, my, in the years that I've worked as an exorcist, which is the better part of 20 years, um, I, I've never kept formal statistics, but, but I've, I've been very aware of the general statistic as to how many people who come to me and and who really don't desire liberation. And that is six out of 10 people. Six out of 10 people who come looking for an exorcist really don't want a, a, an exorcist. What they want is some problem eliminated out of their life, but they're not ready to turn their life over to Christ. Uh, so I'm thinking of one person in particular, she had made a, a, a pact with the devil to receive preternatural powers as a medium, as a clairvoyant. And she would use these powers in necromancy and calling forth the dead and telling people's fortune and so forth. She earned a living out of this and she, she gained a great power. She was tantalized by the kinds of things she could see in people and anticipate within them. And that really exhilarated her. Well, you know, the devil at, at a certain point, you know, he makes his deals, but there's always more than what you bargained for. And so he came to collect and he came uh, putting, uh, well, causing her health to deteriorate and causing just wild phenomena to happen inside her home such that she couldn't sleep. Well, she came to me as an exorcist, hey, you know, get the devil out of, out of my life, but I only want him out in terms of the the noise that 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 he's causing in my home and any way that he's attached to my health, but sure as heck, don't you know? I'm not going to renounce the powers that I got to be a medium clairvoyant and so forth. Well, it doesn't work like this. If you're in the devil's employ or vice versa, if he's in your employ, then you've chosen him as your lord, and that that's who you got. So you you can only receive the benefits of Jesus Christ if you choose to walk with Christ. If you walk with Christ, then you're protected by him. If you choose not to walk with him, then you're not. And so exorcism is very much about severing one relationship, a toxic relationship, and forging another one, a wholesome one with Christ. Mm. So this, um, <clears throat> this, this, Presumption obviously is is in, juxtapos in juxtaposition to human will, right? Do you ever encounter anybody who was maybe tricked or uh, did not uh, utilize their will as this gate, as this door that you're speaking of for an entry? And then with that entry, it sounds like there's even some sort of like pockets in your soul that you let them into uh, do they infest all of the human soul or is it just a part of it? I'm just kind of curious as to sort of some of the details within that. Okay, so let, let's start with your first question. And I may, by, by the time I'm done answering this, I may have to have you repeat your second one. Okay. But certainly um, with 
um, with exorcism, what you've got is a, a covenant made with evil. Now, that covenant, uh, by and large, in, in the vast majority of cases, uh, uh, in terms of possession anyway, is you have uh, a decision that has been made by the individual, a decision that brought the devil into his or her life. Now, no one ever does that explicitly. I mean, nobody ever says, hey, you know, Satan, I invite you into my life, come into my soul and possess me. No one has, I mean, I've never heard of anybody ever doing that. I'm not saying that it's never happened in history, but certainly I've done a lot of exorcisms and I've never encountered that reality. And no one that I know, no exorcist I know has ever encountered that. So, so the first part of the answer to your question is, there, there's all what you're, when you're making, when you're dealing with the devil, there's always part of the deal that you don't anticipate. You're always getting a Trojan horse. You're getting more than what you anticipated. And that more is detrimental. It's not beneficial. So that's one thing. Secondly, you asked about whether it, there's always a, an explicit decision or, or a, a a, a definite agreement um, that someone has to make with the devil in order to bring, to, to forge an attachment to him. And, and there's a, a two-part answer to that. And, uh, and that is yes and no. Um, you know, that we, we all know that we, we've heard of the movie, The Exorcist, which uh, this year, it's, uh, it's the 50th year anniversary of, of, of that movie. And the story was based on a true story of, of, a, of a young boy who became possessed. And, and that happened because his aunt, who was working as his babysitter, came in and brought a Ouija board. And, and as, at a young age, uh, he was just a young adolescent, was invited to play with it. And so that was the cause of his possession. Now, that kid certainly didn't know what he was getting into. But in a sense, in one sense, it doesn't matter. You're opening a spiritual portal. And whatever is on the other side of that door, well, that's, that's what you bargained for. right? It's just like analogously in, 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 in physical reality, you know, someone knocks on your front door. And you decide to open the door without looking. And on the other side of the door could be somebody bringing you a newspaper. It could be somebody, it could be the mailman saying, hey, I've got a parcel for you. Or it could be somebody there with a knife who wants to put that knife through you multiple times. And you're gonna get what you're gonna get. Because as soon as you open that door, you're subject to what's on the other side. And it is no different in the spiritual life. Now, that being said, the hold the demon has on somebody is going to be proportionate to the consent that somebody gives with regard to a sinful action, a sinful choice, with regard to uh, the, the kind of action uh, that led to the relationship with the devil. So in, in that little kid, uh, in, in the movie, the actually in the story, The Exorcism, uh, it was, the movie was based on uh, William Peter Blatty's book called The Exorcist, he didn't choose the devil. He didn't choose to sin. And, and it would be debatable whether he even incurred sin at his young age while he was playing the Ouija board. Now, so in one sense, with regard to his possession, it doesn't matter. With regard to him being in a state of possession, with regard to the demon staying inside him, though, it does matter a great deal. Because although there, there, there needed to be some act of repentance, there was no explicit relationship with the devil formed. Mm -hmm. That would be different than say, if you or I got out the Ouija board and started to play with it, the hold in us would be much deeper. We would be subject to a much stronger demonic hold simply because the, there's, there's a, a deeper covenant there. there. There's more of a surface area uh, to which the devil can forge himself. Yeah, yeah, you answered the second question there, probably unbeknownst to you. But <laughs> yeah, and and you know, like something that um, in in previous interviews on exorcism and and to your other question, Delacross is, um, in the sense of like, can a possession take place where there is no will from the agent that is possessed? 
So, Father Carlos, I guess the, the question more specifically is like, um, have there been cases of possession where someone does not form a type of contract um, or covenant uh, with evil in, in that respect? Uh, yes, there have. Absolutely. So uh, I'm thinking of, for example, uh, you know, I've seen cases and involved with cases with people who were born into satanic sects or in some cases, Wiccan sects whereby they were consecrated to evil from the time they were infants. Some of them were consecrated from the time they were in the womb. So the very parents are handing the child over to the devil. So at this point, the child has no will to speak of, uh, just like when we present a baby for baptism, an infant, a newborn, he has no will to speak of. His will is unformed. So uh, he can't, he or she can't give consent to anything. But the parents give the consent on his or her behalf. And the parents present the child for baptism to the church, child receives the baptism. And so with the, the commitment of the parents, the child receives the benefit. And the reverse can also be the case. Mm. If, if for some sick reason, heinous reason, parents decide to give a child over to evil, then the universe being constructed the way it is by the Lord, he's created a moral universe with moral consequences to actions. Uh, not just the, Those moral consequences don't just apply to us, but they apply to others, uh, especially those who are in our care, then the devil can pounce on that. And, and so that certainly does happen. And, and certainly one can become possessed in that regard. Um, I, I dealt with one case uh, that was quite visceral uh, where where this she was now a grown woman, but she had been uh, consecrated to evil from the time she was young, and there were multiple ceremonies that took place, and then she was formed in a way that would be absolutely antithetical to the way of life that you and I know, and that, and that you and I were raised in the in the in the Judeo Christian view. Uh, she she was uh, formed to be uh, in this in this group that was constantly rebellious towards God, towards the Lord. Uh, now, when she became aware in her adult life that, wait a minute, there's something innately unhealthy about this and I want out, um, then that was the first movement of her liberation because now she was taking ownership. She had recognized what was going on in her, recognized it as not good, even though she had no formation in in, in proper faith and proper religion, she had been raised to fear God, just like we fear the devil. But she had come to recognize what I've been taught is wrong. And so that not only was a great grace, uh, but it was also an act of that demanded great courage because she now had to break away from that sect. Uh, and if, if she were to be caught, they would have killed her. Um, but she was possessed because of everything done to her. Um, she was possessed viscerally. Uh, but what I find is, uh, as, as the exorcisms took place and went on, uh, there was a tremendous amount of grace that Christ gave in this situation because, precisely because she had not chosen the devil. Her, her, her will was not personally engaged. And the fact that it was personally disengaged from the devil uh, meant that uh, the, the liberation, which took a long time to, to come about, it, it wasn't easy, but it, 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 was, it was easier than in terms of, of others who had expl explicitly cooperated with the devil um, through doing, say, a much lesser act than what her parents did to her. You've mentioned exorcisms in that respect and, and, and multiple efforts, and it was, a, it was a labor and ministry that took place over a long period of time. Um, are there multiple rituals? Are there prayers? Can you kind of uh, share a little bit more on the context of the ministry itself and, and how you would approach a, a typical case or a case like this where it's like it, there's constant follow-up uh, needed? Yeah, sure. So, so the, the average exorcism uh, they, well let me let me start it in a different way 
the, the average possession case requires multiple exorcisms uh, in order to be accomplished. And, and um, you know, I've, I've charted my own, I've asked my colleagues numerous times, and the general consensus is the average possession case requires something in the neighborhood of 75 exorcisms. So um, to state it in a different way, um, if you're performing an exorcism on an individual once a week, it's going to take you a year and a half to get the devil out. Some, some are take a, a heck of a lot longer. Uh, others, uh, one session has been enough, uh, even with, even with a full possession. So there's a lot of mystery to to this craft, to this work, and you really just don't know what you're getting into until you get into it. Uh, and even still at the end, it's Christ who exercises. I mean, I'm, I'm his agent, that's it. Um, and if, if it's not me doing the task, then it's some other exorcist. Who it is really, in one sense, doesn't matter because it, it's Christ that's, that's, that's bringing about the liberation. Uh, that being said, I mean, certainly there are, there are human skills and, and human abilities that you bring into it. There's, there's an awareness and a wherewithal that if you don't have that, it, it, it'll be detrimental. If you do have it, it's beneficial both for you and for the victim. So how does, you know, and I, I can't imagine saying the <clears throat> typical exorcism case because it's such an atypical occurrence. But for somebody like yourself who's experienced so many, there there could be some some consistencies or some uh, noticeable patterns. What um how does it manifest itself in a person? How can somebody identify that maybe they are under a spiritual attack? Because I know that there's degree, you know, there's spiritual oppression and and s- spiritual obsession and then possession. There's degrees to this. But how does one how does it how does it manifest itself? How can it be identified? Yeah, so if you're talking about possession per se, um, the most obvious symptom to the individual are blackout periods. Uh, So that's what possession is, a demon takes over. And when the demon takes over, your consciousness is pushed aside and the demon takes over the controls, he's sitting in the driver's seat. So when a victim is possessed, then he or she is not aware that she that that the possession is happening because they're in a state of internal unconsciousness, and so besides a blackout period, people will say to them, "Hey, you did this. This is what you were saying. This is what you were doing," but it'll be they'll, they'll identify saying it was you, but it wasn't you. There was a personality in you that didn't act like you. Uh, was much more belligerent. Was uh, was scary. Was violent, and so on. Uh, so that, in terms of possession, that's going to be the most obvious thing. But, you know, in terms of diabolical activity, the most common diabolical activity that, that exists is simply temptation. And, and I will say this, that that is also the most dangerous. Uh, people can go to heaven while being possessed. It's possible to go to heaven while being possessed. It is not possible to go to heaven with a mortal sin in your soul. So if you were to die with a, with a single mortal sin on your soul, God forbid, you will never see the inside of that. So we it, it can come to pass that, say, a mortal sin led to the possession. And in fact, the devil can possess with a single mortal sin. I mean, he gains those rights. And why, why does he gain those rights? Well, we have to remember where we're coming from. You know, when, when you and I, when we were conceived inside our mother's womb, uh, right, so so when when the physical matter came together that created new life, and God implanted a soul within that life, so it was a a, a mixture of of human and divine action in that instant. At the moment that new life began to exist, the penalty for original sin became instantiated within us, and so what that meant is we belong to the devil. We didn't belong to our mothers and fathers, and we sure as heck didn't belong to God. Right? And this is why we baptize babies, is, is to change the right of ownership over them. And so in baptism, not only is just original sin washed away, but that very action, what it means is we receive God the Father as our Father, 
He wasn't our father before that. So John the Apostle is very clear. He's only talking to Christians when he's talking about children of God. Prior to baptism, we are not God's children. We are his creation, but we're not his children. So baptism makes God our father. It gives us Jesus Christ as our savior. The Holy Spirit is given to us as our sanctifier. The Spirit gives us the virtues. It gives us, he gives us the extraordinary gifts uh, of, of the life of the Spirit. We receive the angels and saints as our brothers and sisters in the faith. And we receive a vocation in Christ. And that grace that we receive, that new identity, which permeates the entire part of our being, remains operative and exists until we commit a single mortal sin. And then the effects of our baptism are undone. You, you can never undo a baptism. But the effects of the baptism, they cease to be operative. And so one we cease being a child of God the Father. We cease having Christ as our Savior and having the Holy Spirit as our sanctifier and everything else. And we once again revert to belonging to Satan, uh, who becomes our father. And that state remains until we confess our sins sacramentally, until that mortal sin is removed from our soul. So the devil can possess through the committing of one single mortal sin. In other words, he gains those rights. Uh, so the next question would be, perhaps, well, if he gains those rights, why don't we see it more often? And, and the answer to that is just the mercy of God doesn't permit it. And thank God. Uh, because if, if, if you were to imagine every single person in the state of grave sin in the world, if they were possessed simultaneously, what would the world look like? It'd be, it'd be awful. And so, um, but that being said, the devil can possess through the, the, the fall of, 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 of one sin uh, that is mortal in nature. Great. Thank you. Um, in your journey as a, an exorcist, 20 years, it's a long, a long time. Um, is there any instances or uh, recollections you have um, of, of just being afraid or something going on that you were not expecting or have not seen where, you know, you felt like you were being drawn, uh, away and trying to be tricked into fear or despair or anything like that? Yeah. So, um, I get that question a lot. Um, and, and the, the short answer would be no. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't fear the devil. I respect him. I highly respect him, but I don't fear him. So what would be the difference between respecting the devil and fearing him? And, and the analogy that I that I always use to describe this is 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 one of the of the, the 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 knife in the kitchen, right? So inside your kitchens, you you gentlemen will have at least one knife that is sharp enough, sharp enough to cut you if you're not careful. And so because of that, you're, you're careful with that knife because what can result if you are not careful. But as sharp as that knife is and as much damage that it could potentially cause, when you go to bed at night, you never think about that knife. You, you never lose any sleep over it. If you did, I think you yourselves would agree that there'd be something amiss with your mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true with the devil. The devil in the grand scheme of things, you know, as a reality next to the reality of God is a very, very minor reality, but he is dangerous. And so for that reason, he has to be respected because you, you can get hurt if, if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't fear him. I mean, I, 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 I belong to God. I already know the ending of the story. God is going to win. And in the end, my consolation is the fact, and I think the consolation of every exorcist who is worth his soul, is in the fact that the battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. And the Lord is the one who's exercising. He may use me as an agent, and I might be, I might be useless. I might be lacking in some area. But at the end of the day, 
all I can do is the best I can do in Christ's name, and I leave the rest up to him. And there, there's a consolation in that, because at the end of the day, it doesn't rest on me. I am not the savior of the world. I'm not the savior of this possessed victim. Uh, the, the savior is Christ. So so that's a job that I need not apply for because it's already filled. And it's mm-hmm. filled by somebody who's infinitely better than me. And so all, all I can do is do what the church asks me to do, do it in the best way that I know how, and put my faith in the Lord that he's going to bring about a resolution according to his time. And that, friends, you know, for an exorcist, that is, is a recipe for mental health. Mm-hmm. That really, it, it belongs to Christ and, and because he is the savior and, I, and I'm not. Father Martins, you know, I think you I think you brought up something very, very important, and it's like to do what the church has asked you to do. You know, you've 20 years, you've been exercising the ministry of, of an exorcist, and your pastoral ministry has brought you all over the world. And I'm sure, you know, when it comes to, you know, the titling of your podcast, Exorcist Files, you know, the, the files that you have in your, in your memory bank, I'm sure are, are plentiful. And I think that's some of the premise of, of what uh, your podcast uh, shares in, in, in detail. Um, at what point did the church, what, how did you, how did you come into this ministry? And, you know, how has the church asked you to do this ministry? And um, what do you hope to get out of this uh, podcasting effort that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So, uh, well, I started even before my ordination as a priest. Now, I was not performing solemn exorcisms or what we call solemn exorcisms. In, in other words, using the ritual of the church to liberate uh, someone who is possessed. Uh, but I was doing what we call minor exorcisms. So there's some kind of demonic hold at some level short of possession whereby you're, you're guiding that victim to exactly do what you do, in, even in a, solemn, uh, in, a, in a solemn exorcism, you're, you're getting them to renounce the actions that brought the devil in, and you're, you're getting them to claim, to make counterpart claims where they dedicate their lives to Christ, and you're praying on their behalf, and you're commanding the devil to leave, and you're commanding his works to leave and you're, you're commanding that he let go of, of, of the operation within this victim, so to speak. Um, so how that how it came about is uh, really like when I was, I, I just had people come to me asking for prayers, even when I was a seminarian. And then as a deacon, I, re, I was assigned to a parish and the exorcists of the diocese I, I were at the parish at, at which I was assigned. And they were just so busy. It was, it was, depending on the time, depending on the years that, that I was there, there was always two or three exorcists there. And they were so busy with cases, with persons, that when, say, a house infestation case came, when, when the devil was in a house causing just diabolical phenomena to happen uh, in the different rooms and so forth, and just harassing the family that was there, one of them just turned to me, gave me a bucket of holy water, said, Deacon, go get rid of the devil. And, and I remember I, I had no training uh, at the time, and, but I, I just, I had a wherewithal that, hey, if the devil's there, he's there for a reason. And so it's my job to discover what that reason is. And so I set about um, leading the people in the house through uh, a renunciation, through uh, them renouncing whatever it was, whatever actions that were incongruent with the life of a Christian, with the life of God, and and to lay claim to that life. And they promised to go to confession and so forth. And so when that was done, then uh, I I just went and I blessed the house. And I said a prayer asking God to remove uh, any demons, any and every demons from the house. And and it worked. Uh, So it was relatively easy. As a demonic hold gets higher, certainly in the state of possession, uh, it's much more difficult, uh, and, and it, re- it requires a much more concerted effort. Mm-hmm. 
Excellent. And then as it relates to these, uh, these memories the, from your beginnings, kind of seeing God inspire this, uh, this movement in your ministry, receiving that authority and commissioning from the priests that were delegated with this authority from the bishop and having kind of a rectory full of exorcists, it was pretty evident that God was nurturing that from the very beginning of your holy orders. And then that being a part of your pastoral ministry for over 20 years now, uh, what's the inspiration behind the exorcist files? And, and uh, you know, what's the thought process and what do you hope to uh, affect through this ministerial effort going online? And I want to give a shout out to our friend, Ryan Bethea, who's your co-host. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. Great guy. And- and um, he actually is the one who introduced us to this podcast and Father Carlos. So I wanted to make sure that we mentioned him. But yeah, that's a great question mm-hmm. is, you know, how, what are you trying to get out of this? And what, what can someone expect when they tune in? Yeah. So the, the podcast episodes are, they consist of teachings and reenactments of, of actual cases from my files. So they would not be recordings of actual exorcisms, but recreations whereby I'm teaching a point, I'm, I'm narrating a case, but the case itself is being played out with voice actors. And it's in a sense, it's a little bit like, uh, like an old time radio show where you're, you're hearing the scene being acted out all around the narrator. And what I hope to achieve with it is to just make people aware that there's so much going on in our society right now that, that can put us in relationship with evil. You know, at, we, don't, we don't hear about evil a lot. Uh, we, we don't hear about it even at Sunday Mass a lot. We don't hear about the devil a lot. And to, in today's day and age, the, the dangers are more than ever because Christendom is being usurped by paganism. So the, the, the West is has all but abandoned its Christian identity. And to a large extent, it despises it. And so what you have is a reversion to paganism. And we see it left and right. We, we, we see it in, in the Grammy Awards that happened earlier this week. Uh, we see it in a detestation of, of the weak, uh, in, uh, of, of life in the womb, of, of senior citizens. We see a movement towards euthanasia happening. And we, we see it just in, in very common, non-dramatic levels in our every, everyday life. Uh, uh, you know, a, a woman goes to the spa for a treatment and they offer her uh, a Reiki treatment, um, which, which is an act of the occult. Um, a, a business professional is offered membership in the Freemasons because um, it'll give him increased business contacts and he finds that appealing. So what, what are the implications of such things? And no one is really talking about this. And so, in, in fact, the, the, how this came about was in a conversation between Ryan Bethay, John Sullivan, uh, two producers of, of, of movies in Hollywood, who they had a conversation with some officials in the Vatican, And they wanted to do a modern day recreation of experiences with evil and of the miraculous. And so the the Holy See tapped me uh, to to undertake this because I do both. And and I I have a ministry of relics whereby I bring a Vatican exhibit uh, to churches, schools and prisons worldwide. And then I have this ministry with exorcism. So we were put in contact with one another. And I think it's coming up on about three years uh, that that relationship started. And the Exorcist Files podcast is the first stage. It's the first level uh, that we're putting out this catechesis in order to inform people, in order to make them aware of the reality of evil uh, and to show people what the implications are if we cooperate with evil. You know, Father Martins, this is uh, such a, a great way to reconnect, and and uh, I know Maria Goretti uh, has commissioned you for some great work in in her name, my birthday saint and my patroness that uh, that I just love so dearly. 
and just coming to the Diocese of St. Augustine recently with your pastoral ministry. Um, so, you know, you're not limited to the ministry of, of exorcism. You also have this wonderful uh, privilege before the Vatican to uh, to bring the beautiful first-class relics and the heritage of the faith and the lives of the saints and the experiences of deliverance and, and uh, prayers uh, through their intercession has really been a part of your charism. So, you know, God has set your ministry into motion and taking effect. And here at the talk show, we want to wish you and Ryan and, and your producers uh, great success. It's already happening on Spotify. So be sure to go to exorcistfiles.tv to all of our friends, our listeners, our viewers online on YouTube and all of the platforms. You know, this, this is the Catholic Church, and there are many, many avenues of encountering Christ and his authority but to rest assured that Christ's mercy endures forever and Christ is for us a savior. And it is by the power of his resurrection and the authority that he has placed upon us as his children to go out and not be afraid as father Martins was saying, Mm -hmm. you know, as we, as we enter into a world of darkness and the unknown, you know, the words of our great Pope, St. John Paul, the second, you know, echo throughout time and it's scriptural 365 times in the scriptures, the derivatives of be not afraid. You know, we walk in confidence because we walk with Christ and Christ's love is for us. And if Christ's love is for us, there's no power that could come against us. Mm -hmm. So, Father Martins, thank you so much for your time today. And again, we encourage you, go out and see exorcistfiles.tv. Yeah, thank you again, Father. Um, Can't uh, recommend it enough. And a shout out to our friend Ryan. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming on. And we're going to pray for your continued success and protection. And please pray for us. Thanks, Absolutely. God bless you all. God bless your families and your listeners. Yep. Hope to see you in mind, Rad. God bless. Man, God bless. See you all next week. Peace.